Okay, okay, fine. Okay, we'll start. Uh, so welcome to uh, lecture eight of this uh, generative modeling. Uh, since the, in the past seven lectures, we have completed the VAs as such. So we looked at how to formulate VAs, the basics for VAs, and we also did the PyTorch tutorial last class. Uh, now uh, what we want to do is uh, we'll look at GANs in a bit more detail. Uh, so initially the idea was that we'll go through intuition and move ahead, uh, but we'll see. We'll go into the math and see you know, what, uh, what makes sense. So last time we, we spoke a bit on the intuition part of the GANs. Um, Intuition part of the GANs. So uh, uh, what we spoke was that uh, how, for example, in VAs we have this variational approach being taken. In GANs we're just taking the uh, random variable transformation approach, right? And we spoke about uh, if uh, since we don't know the transformation function for a from 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 a known distribution to an unknown distribution, how do we go ahead and update it? And we say that if we have another network which can tell me whether uh, whether the sample is from the true distribution or not, uh, then we can use that to update uh, the way uh, my current uh, function is working, right? And we looked at some issues with that way of learning basically. So when we have gradients coming up from this sort of a function, I can have issues in terms of uh, its saturation and, and so on. Um, so now we'll look at the uh, we'll look at one intuition, one reasoning behind uh, GANs and how to derive that sort of thing. So first uh, point is uh, we want to understand whether KL as a metric is good enough or not, right? So if you remember, this is what we were trying to minimize, uh, right? So let's say I have a, a true distribution PX and I have a model distribution P theta. So the idea was if we want to minimize this KL divergence, KL of Px, P theta, and we say that this is uh, the minimum value you can take it is take it take is zero, and if we reach zero, then Px will become will become P theta, which is exactly what we want. Uh, and when we expand this KL term, we get this sort of uh, uh, you know uh, definition. Now the question is, uh, we want to understand how KL behaves when you know things uh, in two different regions mainly. One is, for example, let's say I have a region in which Px of x is larger than P theta, mm -hmm. right? So then what will happen is basically again. So if, if you think about it, this term will become very, very large, right? And multiply with this term. So basically my KL will be large, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, and since I'm trying to minimize the KL, right? So basically the idea is that where um, so where Px is large, so where Px is large, what will end up happening is P theta will also try to be large, right? Uh, will be hopefully uh, be large, right? So, uh, but then, uh, and that is because the KL divisions was very high at that point. Now let's say if, if the Px is very low than P theta, right? So then what will happen is this term will get very low value and uh, hence the KL uh, diversity will not be very high. So KL is low. So this sort of a, uh, you know, uh, a, a space in which this happens, it is not optimized. Right or less optimized or basically that sort of a uh, this sort of an issue is not really readily, uh, uh, you know, uh, updated by KL in a in a good sense, right? So this this shows that there is some sort of an issue with the scale metric. So what will end up happening at the end of the day is that wherever P theta of X was larger than PX, that will not get optimized. So what will happen is you will get, um, what is it called? Uh, hallucinating uh, patterns, right? Because you will get, or you'll get something out of, sam out of uh, distribution sort of uh, samples. Right, because at the end you will sample from p theta of x. So with the real samples will somehow be able to capture, but the samples which are not in p p x of x, you will not be able to uh, uh, penalize them. So you will get these sort of very weird sort of uh, you know outputs from this p theta of x. So this uh, so, and, and 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 actually there are two nice uh, links here which which talk more about this sort of an issue and how to solve uh, how people have tried to solve those. Uh, and stuff like that, right? 
now uh, so th this shows us that okay can we look at some other type of metrics in the first place right so kl divergence is just one such metric so what we'll now look at is something called as f divergence so f divergence is defined by let's say df of pq again p and q are two distributions uh, is de it's defined by this uh, uh, integral that is in integral q of x f of p of x by q of x dx now where f is basically a function which takes the real numbers a positive real numbers as input and and spits, spits out any real number it should be convex and lower semicontinuous function and f of 1 should be zero now lower semicontinuous may be a bit new term so lower semicontinuous means let's say you have a function which is continuous almost everywhere but at one point there is some discontinuity and we have defined that at this particular point f of x naught right is this value let's say this is a and this is b so this is equal to a ideally f of x naught may not be defined also but you define it to be equal to a so the left hand limit will will exist but the right hand limit may not be equal it will exist but it is not equal to this is point right so such functions are called uh, lower semicontinuous functions and what are we saying we are saying that it, it should be convex and lower semicontinuous and one thing is very clear that uh, if uh, a function is lower semi in the same way we can go on and define define upper semicontinuous same idea but the upper point for example will be the uh, you know function value uh, similar terms now uh, and a continuous function a general continuous function is basically both lower and semi lower and upper semi continuous then it's a se continuous function right so for our for our current uh, discussion we'll uh, stick to continuous functions convex continuous functions low semi continuous will require some additional proof here and there i'll i'll let you know where and uh, why that is becomes a bit difficult to understand so now the question is okay uh, so actually now if you put f of u as u log u that is in our uh, in our uh, definition of f right if you put u log u you will get back the kl divergence term so kl divergence is actually a form of f divergence itself right and for this you need to prove that f is convex and continuous straight forward f of 1 is 0 so just put this you will get uh, df equal to dkl right so uh, ha huh. Now KL divisions we proved some uh, you know uh, properties that uh, is always non-negative and so on. So DF is also greater than or equal to zero, and if DF is zero, that is if, 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 if F divisions is zero, that means P will be equal to Q, right? Again, we're not proving these things for now. We will see going forward. So now we'll go to this uh, lo convex lower semi-continuous functions properties. Uh, there's something called as Penchel conjugate. So if f of u is convex lower semi-continuous, then we define this function called as f star of t, which is defined as supremum over this u t minus f of u uh, function uh, over all u, which is the domain of f. This f star is called as Penchel conjugate, right? So basically, what is happening here is that for every t we are looking at, let's say if this is f of u, right? This is f of uh, u function. So now u t is basically a line in this space, right? Which passes through uh, the origin, right? So let's say this is u t, right? So let's say for uh, t equal to one, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at what is the supremum of this difference, right? So we're saying uh, this minus this. So you look at these differences and you look at the supremum over all possible uh, values of f of u. This is called as f star of t. This is called a Penchel conjugate. Now uh, there are some properties which are interesting for us. First thing is this f star is also the convex lower semi-continuous. Second thing is f star's conjugate is f of u again. So that's interesting for us because so uh, I will see why. And then um, sorry, yeah. And then uh, uh, we have some other properties like this. So where uh, so f star f star uh, what is that uh, derivative right so this is basically uh, d by dt of f star of t right this is equal to d by dx of f of x are we doing it x or u u sorry okay so um so u right and its conjugate right this is the definition 
Fentyl conjugate. Fentyl conjugate. Okay. It's fentyl conjugate. And then uh, similarly, this uh, so this basically stands for F derivative of F derivatives conjugate. This uh, function basically is nothing but I of x. I of x means basically x an eddy function, right? So this is the idea. So this is d by let's say du of f, right? Evaluated at this quantity, right? So this is going to be d by du of f conjugate evaluated at uh, let's say x, right? This is the idea. So we'll use these properties to now understand uh, how to move ahead with this f can. So first property that we want to use is this idea that f star star is equal to f, right? So what does that mean? Uh, so if I put f star of uh, f star of f star, it turns out to be like this, right? So um, sup of t of domain of f star, right? Because f star is a function that we are uh, looking for a special conjugate and now this is equal to t u minus f star of t right this is f of u again from the uh Fentyl conjugate property so what we'll do now is in the f divergence uh, uh you know uh formula we'll put its potential it's, it's double potential conjugate term right so now my df uh, uh, uh sorry uh, f divergence becomes Q of X into this supremum, right? So because it's F of U, so P of X by Q of X into T minus F star of T, right? Uh, now the supremum is, is over T, so I can multiply, I can take this Q of X inside, not a problem, right? Because it doesn't, doesn't depend on T. So now I can write this supremum as P of X into T minus Q of X into F star of T. Simple. Now, uh, the question is, how do we evaluate this integral, right? We we do neither have it in the form of an expectation where I can just do sampling and stuff like that, right? So one no, one thing that you, that you need to note here. So if you see here, we are doing a pointwise maximum, right? For every x, we are trying to find uh, which t is the best, and then apply that t here, right? So if I can write that mapping from x to t in a form of function. Let's say t of x, right? So t of x is supposed to give me that t which is maximizing this, right? Now, um, uh, if I write it in this form, I can now look at this as a lower uh, upper uh, lower bounded by this particular term, right? So which is saying that I will look at uh, this value will be upper bounded by uh, the supremum over all t over some class of functions capital T, right? So capital T is a set of all set of all functions which go from this space x to r space, right? Because you want a r, it's a real number, right? A single scalar value. Now here, uh, so, na so so so, so we are taking supremum outside the integral, right? So this becomes p of x into t of x because t of x is, is giving me that t back. And I'm putting that uh, f star of t uh, back as f star of t of x. So the supremum can be seen as in in for, for for one more intuition behind why this will be an upper bound is because here we're taking it's like say, saying take take the maximum uh, sum of all maximums, right? Whereas here it is maximum of some sums, right? So obviously this will this value will be more than this value, right? So hence it becomes a upper bound, right? Now. If you see, I can write this as an expectation over P of X and this an expectation over Q of X, right? So this uh, basically tells us that the F divergence is uh, upper bounded uh, by, uh, sorry, lower bounded by this particular value, right? Now the question is, we, we want to solve for this supremum, right? Which, what is the best T which actually uh, is, is uh, solves this particular problem, right? So what is the best T? Now, previously we discussed something called as the um, uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, right? So why we are using this uh, that again here is because we want to optimize a function like this, right? So let's say if I write J as uh, this expectation, right? And uh, this can be seen as an uh, as a function of x, t of x, and t prime of x. 
right now here we want to know which is the best function that is t which maximizes this value j this integral j so that can be done using this Euler Lagrange equation so we are saying that okay the optimal t will satisfy this particular uh, equation of uh, j of l right so now when we when we put this uh, particular thing here so let's go through this so here uh, again t prime doesn't ex come come in this l at all so i just have dou l by dou t at t equal to t optimum so should be equal to zero sorry so t prime is d, uh, d by dt of uh, this one d by dx of t of x right because there's, there's no term that it comes here so we can uh, this becomes zero and so on right so now dl dou l by dou t at t equal to t of should be equal to zero so that if I do that here, I will get P of X minus Q of X into F star prime of T of X, right? Mm -hmm. And T of X uh, evaluated at T optimum yeah. of X equal to zero, right? So this now implies your F star prime of T optimum of X is equal to uh, P of X by Q of X right now what we'll do is now we'll apply uh, the the property from the Fenchel conjugate uh, this one right there we go yeah so this property right so and this property together so what will happen is um, I will get this will become f prime star of t optimum of x equals to p of x by q of x right and then uh, apply f prime on both the sides so this becomes i of x that is t optimum of x becomes f prime of p of x by q of x right simple so this became the optimal uh, t okay so what have we done till now? We have shown that, okay, uh, my F divergence will be uh, upper bounded by, uh, sorry, lower bounded by this value when you are uh, at T equal to T optimum. Now, the next claim is if T optimum belongs to capital T because you have ch chosen a, a set of functions, you've chosen that class of T. So if it belongs to this, then the bound is tight. So the bound we said, was uh, so bound is that we need to show df minus lower bound is greater than is equal to zero then we can say that f divergence is equal to the lower bound that i have right so we'll go ahead and do that so let's say df minus the lower bound whatever we have right so df is basically this quantity f of p of x by q of x minus so the lower bound um this value at t equal to t optimum right so let me just or take this only huh. right so now i have T optimum and T optimum, right? And dx again here. So this ends up being Q of x minus P of x into T optimum is F prime of P of x by Q of x plus here, right? We're doing minus lower bound. So plus Q of x into f star of f prime of p of x by q of x dx now this so what we'll do now for simplicity i'll uh, write this p of x by q of x as r r of x okay uh, therefore p of x becomes q of x into r so this becomes integral q of x f of r i'll leave x also uh, minus this becomes q into r f prime of r plus q into f star of f prime of r right 
so this now can be written as minus r times f prime r plus f star of f prime of r right dx so this is basically expectation over uh, q right of this quantity right so if i somehow prove that this this quantity is equal to zero then this is uh, this thing will, will go to will, will become zero right so it'll be tight at, at this particular thing so now um so let's think about that so f star of t we know how it's defined right so it's supremum over u belong to domain of f u t minus uh, f of u right so we're saying i want to evaluate this f star at f prime of r right so f star of f prime of r is nothing but supreme again same domain of f u into this quantity f prime of r minus f of uh, u that's it it only t is only f, f prime of r here right now this whole quantity doesn't depend on uh, u at all right so this quantity now if i add it on the left lhs it's similar like uh, saying adding it on the rhs that to inside the supremum right so this quantity let, let me call this as uh, i standing for integrand so let's say i is now can be written as supremum u domain of f u into f prime of r minus f of u plus f of r minus r times f prime of r right now we need to show that the supremum goes to zero right so uh, now uh, if you remember so uh, f is a convex function right so uh, if you so uh, do you recall any property of convex function with its derivative see if i have a convex function there is a property for a uh, convex function which which relates to its derivative so uh, so so if i have a convex function let's say f of x so we can write as f of y is greater than or equal to f of x plus f prime of x into y minus x so basically saying that all is all the tangents all the, the function will always be greater than the tangent between any two lines that's the idea right so now with this idea uh, we can now look at what is f of u if i expand it in uh, at the point r right so you can write f of r minus f prime of r into u minus r right now this i can write this as um yeah so uh, f of r minus f prime of r into u minus r minus f of u is less than or equal to 0 which one Ah, uh, this one. Sorry. Ha. Mm, correct. Yeah. So this basically is exactly the uh, integrand inside. So this becomes. Uh, uh, yeah. So u into f prime of r is here. Right. U into f prime of r from here, then minus f of u, right, plus f of r from here, and then. Minus r f prime of r, right? This is always less than or equal to zero. So therefore, the supremum sup of this quantity is going to be zero. That's it, right? So what are we saying in this? So we are saying that uh, if the optimal t belongs to the class of functions, then my df uh, I can actually calculate my f divergence. I can say. that the bound is tight so therefore i can just go ahead and evaluate the lower bound that will be equal to my f divergence right so this is the basics that we need now let's see how we go ahead and implement it in our for our can formulation right um so very simple again just a recap of what we did just now right these are the things that, that we have uh, a, a d a, a f divergence can be seen as expectation over this quantity Uh, two different quantities and optimal optimal t is basically f prime of uh, p of p of x by q of x let's go back to our perennial problem 
So we have Px, our actual unknown distribution, P theta model distribution, and our aim is we want to minimize Tf of Px uh, and P theta, right? So now the question is, uh, so uh, fine. So, so I, I can, I, I already know that T optimum of X I have with me, right? So if I put this here and run this uh, optimization, are we done here or is there any problem with this? Uh, so, so minim minimize this one, right? Okay, huh, sorry. Uh, the, again, recap. Let's let's take a small recap on p theta. So basically, that is, I have a, a a random variable, let's say z, which can be let's say for example known distribution, like Gaussian or uh, uniform or whatever, right? And we pass it through a function. Let's say let's call it g, and this uh, function maps this z variable to x uh, space. Right now, what I will do, I will parameterize this G with a neural network and call its parameters as theta, and I will call the resulting distribution of X as P theta of X. Right now, the point is, I have P theta of X and I have P X of X. Right, I want to make P theta of X similar to P of P X of X, as simple as that. So I will use a uh, f divergence uh, method. Yes, you know P X of X only because we have the data. No, no, no. P X of X is, is unknown. No. Right. Right. Uh, we have only samples from it. Uh, we have only samples from it, right? We want to make it as close as this one using samples, right? So now the question is, uh, now we know how to evaluate DF, right? I can run this, uh, I can run this, uh, you know, this one, right? And I will uh, get grades, grains also with, with respect to P theta, right? How will I get now this particular, uh, so let's say, so P is Px, Q is P theta. Right, so this, this expectation is what will have the gradient with respect to p th uh, with respect to theta, right? Uh. Uh, that's it. That's the biggest problem. Yeah, right. So we don't have px, so we don't know what the optimal uh, t is. And though we have q of x, we may not even have it in the closed form, and all of that issues will be there. So we don't have t optimum of x, actually speaking, right? So rather than what we do is we uh, parameterize this t of x as a neural network with parameters let's say tw of x okay so now i have uh, two things to be done here i have two sets of parameters one is theta one is w right so i want to minimize the divergence that is true right i want to minimize this term that is expectation over px right uh, t optimum of x which i don't have so that i'll use tw of x right uh, then minus uh, expectation of p theta or p theta of x uh, with f star of tw of x right but because you don't have the optimal uh, t, uh, w or tw basically what, and whatever we, what were we doing we were saying we, i want to maximize this quantity right i want to find a maximum of this quantity with respect to t that's what we did uh, previously right so therefore i want to maximize with respect to w Right, I at least think so. Basically, maximize with respect to t, but we have parameterized t with w parameters, so I can write max w. This is exactly the uh, adversarial part of this whole uh, generative adversarial network, right? Because it's the same optimization function, right? Let's say I'll call this some f, right? Your uh, p theta is trying to minimize this f, right? But your uh, W, what, or whatever network you have, for example, TW, is trying to maximize this F. So they are trying to uh, reach something like a saddle point in this particular space of theta comma W space, yeah. right? So now what you do is uh, based upon this F, based upon the T, uh, uh, so based upon this F, you will choose a function. Uh, you will choose a, 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 a way for this your for this TW to exist such that uh, your t optimal can belong to the class of functions that you choose because that's again a very important point right so you choose a class of functions such that 
the optimal t of x can probably belong to that particular uh, you know uh, t right so this is where they're coming from so now uh, for example so so we'll now look at the uh, uh, okay so is this clear any anything any doubts here for that for now fine okay so <laughs> Uh, so now we look at the the initial GAN that we had, uh, the first GAN that came out, Ian Goodfellow's GAN, as an F GAN, right? So let's say if you choose the F function to be this u log u minus u plus one log u plus one, right? Uh, if you do that, you can show that the GAN uh, that you uh, evaluate, basically this function that you if you evaluate, q of x, f of p of x by q of x this uh, will turn out to be two times js divergence minus log four now what is js divergence so uh, we saw kl divergence right so js divergence is basically a uh, uh, kl of p with p plus q by two plus half times kl with Q with P plus Q by two, right? So again, uh, just uh, notice that P plus Q by two is again a valid uh, density model. It's a just a mixture model, basically same thing here. So and the point is JS is now a, a symmetric measure, unlike KL, which, which is not symmetric measure. JS is a symmetric measure because if I exchange P and Q, I get the same value, right? So uh, if you run this U log U for this. Uh, and all you will get uh, the the GAN divergence metric to be something like this, right? So basically, what uh, Ian Goodfellow's GAN was doing is trying to optimize this particular divergence metric, which is a bit weird, but whatever. This is what they had. So can you point out some issues with F though? Any any thoughts on and any thoughts on that? So we can take very large values for some values of x. Uh, what can take very large values? This S function huh. can take very large values when like Q of X is very small. Huh, correct, that is true. That is still there. Yes. But the idea is, uh, if for example you don't want that, then you can choose a different F altogether. Okay. That is always there. So hence the idea that okay, we can move to a different divergence metric, right? So, huh. so with this particular F actually, among the assumptions that we made. Uh, any assumption do you think is validated here? Sorry? So assumptions around around this basics that we that we, that we uh, saw just now. So if you see uh, the value of f of one is not zero, very very clearly, right? F of one turns out to be uh, two log two, right? And which is equal to I mean uh, sorry, f of one is minus two log two, uh, which is equal to log minus log four, and that's exactly the point that's coming here. So hence this GAN divergence is not exactly f divergence because uh, uh, at its minimum value is not zero, it's minus log four. Just need to be aware of it. Now we need, then okay. So with this in mind, uh, can we think about what f star could be and what will be the domain of f star? So again, let's recall, f star is defined as uh, this sup over this quantity u t minus f of u. Right. So if you had to do this particular you know, formulation, how would you go about solving it? So what would um, this supremum turn out to be? F of u is u log u plus u plus one log u plus one. So this you can do a derivative in huh. So just take this as a derivative uh, as a, this one. You will get a derivative and you can solve it. Okay. So try it out and let's see, you know, uh, what comes out. Now, this is the uh, crux of the matter, the t opt function. 
So uh, again, we, we remember what T of is basically F prime of P of X by Q of X, right? This should be the optimal uh, T. So then what we do is here F dash, if you look at it, F dash of U, um, you will, um, one second, so, yeah, so basically, u log u minus u plus 1 log u plus 1. So it just come out to be. Minus. Log u plus 1. Yeah, fine. You will. Log of uh, u by u plus 1, right? So now. Uh, so now f prime or, or t optimal of x basically turns out to be log of p of x by q of x divided by the same p of x by q of x plus 1 which is nothing but log of p of x by p of x plus q of x right so uh, basically speaking if you if you see what this function is is we are saying we're trying to do this right one plus q of x by p of x right so in a way we are trying to get the log it right so if your t function t of x is a discriminator so i mean your your classifier right because what does what does classifier do classifier is basically outputs a log it to you, right? It tells what is the probability of it belonging to that versus this, that if you put through sigma uh, sigma, you will get the actual probabilities, right? This is the classifier that turns out to be in, which is there in the, which we discussed in the last class, right? So, um, yeah, so uh, so when you want to implement this particular thing, uh, your normal uh, Yin's GAN, so then what will happen is you will have something like this, minimize with respect to theta, Maximize with respect to let's say your uh, W, right? Expectation over PX. Uh, your T of X is now a classifier, right? So this T of X is just going to output you uh, take a whatever image or whatever, for example, right? And give out a log it. Right? And then minus. This uh, expectation is over p theta, right? P theta of x or whatever. F star. If you if you do this f star function and all, you will get uh, uh, you will get this uh, one minus this t of x log of one minus this t of x, right? In this form, you will get, and this uh, is basically the gradient that is used to uh, update your uh, uh, p theta. The theta function gets gradients from this part of this network, right? And W gets updated from both this part and this part of the network. So this T is what we're calling as discriminator in the previous uh, example, right? This is your D. And P theta is what you get from your generator, right? It takes your Z and maps into your space. So this becomes your generator function. This is how you update. So here, uh, so now there, there was one thing that we discussed last time. Uh, one thing that, we, that I mentioned last time that people try to do this sort of uh, uh, update, uh, uh, discriminator multiple times, uh, generator one time, and so on. That reasoning comes from here, right? Because what you want, you want your T to be as optimal as possible, because you're trying to minimize your F divergence. So if if your uh, if you if your if your bound is not strict, right? So if df is not equal to the t optimal, uh, uh, is not at the t optimal, then if you minimize that f divergence also, it's not going to make sense to you. Rather, the point is if you optimize your discriminator to a, to a large value, to many number of times, then you're actually uh, equate, you're getting the uh, uh, f divergence to be equal to uh, the value that, that, that it computes. And now minimizing it makes sense. So hence, this sort of uh, idea that you maximize with respect to W, whatever we have till now, right? Your whole function. Let's say you do this uh, three or four or five times or whatever in a loop, right? And then, uh, so at this 
after this particular uh, loop, your DF is let's say computed uh, correctly, right? Or it or the bond is tight. Now you may try to minimize this DF with respect to um, theta. That's the idea. This is all about Afghan. And then now people have uh, so be, people found out things like uh, LS, least squares GAN and there are many other GANs that came out. So all of those can be subsumed under this formulation of uh, FGAN because all of those are basically some or the other value of F. They turn out to be F divergence metric and therefore then you can find out your optimal F star, optimal T and everything and therefore design your discipline matter to behave in such a way so that your optimal value, optimal uh, T will always belong to the class of functions that you are looking for. That's the idea. Hmm. Huh. So, so, so this this class of T is basically all those which your T W can represent. Right. So now if I if I make it to represent, for example, all classifiers, that's it. That's the idea. So you you may, then your T optimum can belong to that particular class. Otherwise, for example, let's say if you uh, are trying to output something else altogether, trying to output a let's say some uh, ten-dimensional you know classifier, which is not right because here we have only two classes it, it needs to classify. That sort of a thought process. Clear? This is all about GANs. Simple theory only. I can under all a lot of assumptions, but yeah, this is the uh, thought process. So uh, we'll continue with the discussion that we did last time. So last time we also spoke this idea of mode collapse, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we we, uh, we we came with an example. We said that okay, uh, I have ex all examples of you know dogs with me, and I have this z, which is a known uh, random variable, and this uh, g is a generated function, and it uh, somehow what happens is uh, post training. This G always gives you uh, a, a, a very nice dog's image, right? Actual playing in a field or whatever. And that value goes into the discriminator. And we said that, that now the discriminator will never be able to tell that this is a generated image because it looks so real. It, it's so uh, you know clear as a day. So it is, it, it is not sure and therefore it gives you 0.5 as, as the output, um, the probability that we have. Now, uh, so the generator has now uh, was successful in fooling the discriminator though but not in generating the actual px that you wanted right this is called as mode collapse now why it's called mode collapse is because what has happened at the end of the day is let's say if this is your uh, you know probability space of your let's say px right if this is your px what your model has learned is something like this theta or g theta what we want to call it right so it has basically just learned one particular image and it is always showing ar values around around this only right and because uh, your discriminator is not looking at the all the possible values are, are, at every time it's it gets uh, fooled and therefore you, you haven't done the right job so one ingenious solution I mean, one solution that people have proposed for this is uh, something called as a uh, mad gan so it's I think have a multiple adversarial something like that. So but the idea is this. So instead of having uh, one generator, you will have multiple generators, right? So you'll have Z1 goes into G1 function, Z2 goes into G2 function, and so on. Uh, and finally you have your Px, right? And all of these, again. Uh, at once they go, I mean, at once go into the discriminator, right? So the idea is because your different generators were uh, initialized at different points in their network, so it's possible that each of them will start going towards individual modes. So then hopefully when you want to generate a new image, what you do is you sample, uh, you choose one of these at random and then uh, uh, generate an image from the particular can, from the particular generator. That's one solution that people have. You know, try to solve for this. Okay. This is uh, about mode collapse. Now, uh, there are two interesting GANs which I thought that we should discuss. One is something called a cycle GAN. So, um, 
Okay, so what are we trying to do in our usual problem is we have Px and we want some P theta going towards Px. And the way you're chosen is we have a Z, uh, learn a function, go make this closer towards uh, Px, right? So now instead of saying that I will go from a, uh, you know, known distribution, which is Z, what I do is I take two different data sets itself. So let's say I have horse data set, that is, let's say PH. Again, I'm saying PH because I can sample some horse data set, multiple horses and zebras, right? PZ. Okay. So now what we do is we we're asking a question: Can I go from zebra to horses and horses to zebras, right? So uh, if you think about it, how would the uh, architecture look like here? Any any thoughts on uh, you know what have been what, what what we have been doing till now? Any thoughts on how this architecture would look like? So what is the purpose? We need to find some like p theta something huh. so that like given a sample from p h, we are able to convert it into p z. P z correct. So it can be the neural network. Right. So, okay. So, what the, uh, the network, network will take? Huh, huh. Dimensions. Huh, so, yeah. Same as like dimensions of pH and dimensions of. Okay. Is it random huh. So, I have a network, right. fine, which takes what as input? Samples from the distribution. Huh. Samples from, let's say, pH, for example, right? Okay. Let's say this HZ. Mm -hmm. So, this generates a, let's say, G, uh, let's call this. GZ, right? So it's sam generating samples of zebras. And now I have samples from PZ, right. and these two go into a discriminator. Right? right? That's, uh, I mean, the point. So I have a discriminator for zebra images, right? Mm -hmm. And then to go from back, to go from zebra to, uh, uh, you know, this space. Right? How do I do that? Is basically same. Just repeat this idea. So G Z H. So P Z again samples from here. G uh, H, and then I have P H here. These go into your discriminator for uh, horses, right? So basically, your uh, this these people they push the idea that you need not have a mapping sort of a thing, right? For example. Uh, previously, the approaches to go from, let's say, this horse and zebras was that you need paired samples. Here, you don't really need pairings. Oh, yeah. That's the interesting point here, interesting. right? Because uh, you might, the, the, the network might at the end learn any kind of pairing, but that's what, what you, that's what we want. For a given uh, horse image, generate whatever the pairing you have learned to a uh, zebra image. So these two are not paired. Right. This is the main point here. Now the same authors actually. So, uh, so, so one of the use case for this one sort of a uh, interesting use case is, for example, going from uh, uh, different uh, so painting of different artists. Right. For example, let's say some Monet artist is there and some other artist, for example, right. Some in paintings or uh, some uh, let's say scenery mapping. Right. This could be learned using this sort of an idea, right? Instead of you trying to uh, pair each and every image of uh, paintings of two, two different artists, this is something that the network can do. This is one. Other thing is, for example, uh, you know, old uh, grayscale images to, uh, let's say, you know, your uh, uh, painted images mm -hmm. or, 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 or uh, you know, colorful, whatever, right? Coloring of an image, right? So this sort of a uh, mapping is uh, can be done using this sort of a network, right? And one other thing that they, uh, you know, uh, so they, they tried with just this particular sort of a thing, but they saw that it was not performing that well. Again, uh, it can be attributed to the fact that, you know, you, you have limited samples in PH and limited samples in PZ, whereas here you have infinite samples, right? Your usual this one. So, so what, they, what they additionally did was, uh, let's say I have a generator which takes from 
zebra to horse, right? So I pass a zebra image and I get a horse image. That horse image, I'll again pass it through the generator of zebra to, uh, sorry, horse to zebra, right? Horse to zebra, right? This will generate me a zebra hat, let's say, right? So now they put a loss for these two. They say that whatever mapping you learn from going from zebra to horse should be same as the invert invertible mapping from horse to zebra and so on. Similarly, the, you do the horse for a thing. So horse to uh, the same H Z, uh, G Z H, and you get a horse hat sort of thing. And sorry. Uh, correct. Could be any different color in this topic, right? Yes, it can be. It can be any any different color. Hence, this sort of mapping maybe helps. You know, learning a a more stable sort of a mapping in in that sense. Because, for example, let's say if you take the Solvay conference uh, image of all the great scientists, if it if it puts the faces as all as for example yellow, that doesn't make sense at all. But whereas if I have a colored image. Uh, whose grayscale, uh, you know, uh, we know that it has to be like this. So that can be done. Uh, that, that can be useful for for it to learn. Okay, faces have to be, you know, so and so colors only, and so on. So this is learning that mapping. This is learning that mapping. So here we say, okay, this particular, uh, you know, grayscale to uh, coloring. If you do, you should be able to do that coloring back very well, so that you get grayscale and and and, and back to this. So these are the other. Uh, the last question is this. Huh. Ha, uh, this MSC plus our usual one. Yes, they correct. Have uh, they are. Yeah, they do have a weighting. They have some um, lambdas for this particular thing. This, this they call it a cycle consistency loss, and they and they uh, and, uh, and, uh, they end up using L1 loss. They don't do L2. I mean, uh, not MSC. They use a MAE loss, uh, and so now your your uh, what do you call that? Your loss function is basically minimize theta, maximize W. Same. Expectation, expectation, minus expectation, you know, whatever. Then plus uh, lambda into these two losses, z minus z hat, uh, plus lambda into h minus h hat, sort of a thing. This sort of a thing. And so therefore, uh, so these uh, losses they update only the generators, right? And uh, the discriminator gets updated only by only by these two terms. Generators get updated from from the from the respective uh, term in this one and these two terms. This is the idea. So this is one interesting GAN that, that, that exists. The other interesting GAN, uh, interesting in the sense, it solves for a bigger problem actually. So uh, the question is, again, we asked this question last time also, uh, the, the problem of inference, right? Uh, the point is that we, we cannot ask this question, that is P of Z given X. We don't know the answer to this question in a, in a usual GAN, right? So which Z gave me this particular image? That cannot be answered here in, in normal GAN. So in BIGAN, what they do, they do a, a reverse approach. Again, similar to this cycle, cycle uh, consistency loss idea, a cycle GAN idea, is that, let's say I have a Z generator and goes into the image space, let's say, um, and now, um, I have so this goes into the discriminator. Um, then I have an encoder which takes this X and generates a Z. Okay. Um, and what we want is uh, oh, huh, correct. That's, that's what I was missing. Okay. So now here, what we do is we don't pass just the X to the discriminator, rather, we pass this pair. X and Z, the one that that produces X, that is one uh, pair that goes into this. The other is this pair, the true X, and it's uh, this one. This is another thing. So these two are then, uh, let's say, multiplexed. You'll get discriminator. So discriminator looks at both the uh, image or, or whatever the data space and the latent space. Now here, one interesting thing that you should note is that the encoder and generator never talk to each other, right? They only talk through the gradients coming from discriminator, right? So, but, uh, and, and they end up showing again through mathematical this one also, that if you learn a good, gen uh, uh, whatever generator you learn, the encoder will be exact opposite of the generator. Uh, 
it will give you that that exact z which will give you that x which uh, which you have with you that is the thing so uh, so what the, the 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 point here is e and g never talk to each other right unlike here right and we actually put this sort of constraint forcibly here but that's not the case here e and g never talk and they do that only through uh, gradients only through gradients from the discriminator and that too, uh, then they show up, uh, then they show that E and E is actually equal to G inverse in some sense. That's their uh, proof that you can uh, you can see, right? So that's uh, about um, some interesting GANs. Ah, huh. okay, uh, okay. Any doubts till now? Anything unclear or? Thing. Okay, now we'll uh, uh, we discuss this idea of info VA in the last classes. So info VA, the idea was uh, that we wanted to also uh, maximize uh, the um, uh, mutual information between the data space that you have and the latent space Z, right? And finally, what happened is we came up to some solution, and and we had a term there. The term was this DKL of Q phi with uh, P. And we define Q phi of Z as a uh, uh, integral over X, Q phi of Z given X into uh, Px of X, Px. Okay, this again, uh, I, I would, yeah, so this, this is how we define the Q, uh, Q phi, Q phi of Z. And P of Z is your, your usual, uh, you know, uh, latent that we have generally your N zero I, right? So now the point was uh, that how do I, uh, you know, how do we, uh, so, so this basically turns out to be an, an expectation over PX, sorry, uh, expectation over PX, right, of this quantity, right? So now the question is, if I have to run this scale, basically what I need to do is I need to uh, try to uh, equate this uh, Q5, uh, this Q5 with P, right? So now, uh, so what they've said is you can do this using adversarial minimization. That is, is adversarial learning. So any thoughts, how would you go about doing this? Now that you know GANs. So basically you want to make Q phi and P equal to each other, right? Close, as close as possible, right? Fine. So now I can use KL or I can use any other metric also. At the end of the day, if they become equal, KL, all metrics are the same, all become zero, right? So if I have to use a generative at Brazil network to solve this problem, how would we solve this? Uh, just like classes and we were taking two different classes mm. and trying to convert one class into another uh -huh. and have a discriminator again in that way. Hmm. But okay, so what are the two classes here though? So distribution Px of x and distribution q phi z of x, z given x. No, Px of x and this one we are not trying to match. Okay, then what are we doing? See, this is P of z, right? So, mm -hmm. Uh, or let me open the info VA, this one. Latent distribution, right. So this is what we had, if you remember, okay. right? Mm -hmm. DKL of Q phi of Z and P of Z. P of Z we know, it's a latent distribution, yeah, right? We assume it to be some and form. Huh, we don't have that. Right. This is exactly where we stuck. We said, okay, we how to do this, we have a problem using KL. So we'll use some other metric. And the, for other metric means, We'll have to go to GANs. Very simple because it will work for any diverges metric, right? So if I have like this, how do I use uh, divergence uh, minimization? How, how would be the GAN architecture here? Fix. Fix P. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Oh, do support order of PZ, right? Huh. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm asking how, how, how would the architecture work? So give me a, uh, yeah, yeah. At, the, at the end, how, what, what, what will be the discriminator? What will be the generator? What, how do you bring the problem down to this space? Because your authors have said you can solve this. Huh. Okay. Expand DKL. Okay. So here in our case, it'll be, uh, let's say over X, uh, Q5, oh, sorry, not X, Z space, right? Q5 of Z into log Q5 of Z by P of Z, right? DZ. This is what DKL comes out to be, right? Hmm. Uh -huh. uh, no. will be done uh, okay. Uh, so that, that is if, if you want to use scale divergence only. Okay. I'm I'll give one more hint. You don't need to use scale. Koi be divergence metric lelo. Right? And we also discussed the Ian's GAN also. Ian Goodfellow's GAN, mm -hmm. how, what, he, what he does there, that same approach you can apply here. Hmm. Go ahead. Huh? So let us assume that you know. So P of Z we know. We are busy, we know. So we have, we can generate uh, images using by the clicking sample, so we can generate P of Z entire distribution using it. Correct. Okay. So we have that in one side. Right. And we can start with some Q of Z. Okay. So it's hmm. clear actually. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, we have on one side uh, Z and some generator which gives P of Z. Okay. And then on the other side we have Z, some like generator and then yeah. Generator P of Z. P of Z we have. Okay. Yeah. Ah, and now on ah, the other hand, Z, some other generator. Okay. And Q of Z. Q5 of Z, okay. Q5, uh, Q5 of Z. Right. Now we have a discriminator connecting uh, distribution between P of Z and Q of Z. Okay. This is a, this is a discriminator, right? Huh, okay. Discriminator, no? This is a discriminator. Huh, okay. Huh. Um, okay. Done? Anything else you want to add here? Okay. So, why do you want to generate P of Z again? You know P of Z, no? Okay, not required. Right? Okay. Huh. So right. now we use that to generate X. Right? Generate what? Yeah. There's a latent. There's a latent, yes. Decoder to Correct. Huh. Huh. That's decoder part. Okay. No, huh. so there's no decoder part. Huh. Why would you need? Because you don't want to you just want to compare two distributions in Z space. Q5 of Z is a distribution in Z space, P of Z is in Z space. Need not go to X space, ideally speaking. Just learn G2. G2. Huh. But is this how you sample from Q5 of Z though? What is Q5 of Z? Okay. What should Q5 of we have a we have a we have a way to I mean Q Q5 of Z has to uh, satisfy something right, which is this. Huh. So we use mm. some input sample, uh -huh. come to some latent, uh -huh. we use that latent, we, we sample Q5 Z1X. Uh -huh. That's it, yeah. that's it, right? So because now this can be seen as, again we have finite samples, so this can be seen as I equal to 1 to let's say uh, N, right? Q5 of Z given XN, yeah. right? 
So basically, this is like sampling from a Gaussian mixture model, right? So you choose a sample Xn, get the sam get its, its Q phi. You have a sample from Z now, or this Q phi of Z given Xn, right? That sample is what goes into this, right? So uh, here, when you put the bigger VA picture, X is what we have here, phi. This gives me Q phi of Z given X, right? That Z is what gets connected here, right? Now, the point is you will do this across all samples, across all samples that ever you have, right? So that becomes a distribution Q phi of Z, yeah. right? Because you're looking across all samples. Now, that is what you want to be uh, same as P of Z. Hence, you will pass it through a discriminator, right? So, and then uh, to to generate your uh, what is it called that uh, image or whatever your theta decoder, right? Back to this, whatever you sample from here, you will pass it through this. That's exactly what we're doing uh, VA is right. So now your encoder basically gets trained through two things. Previously, it was uh, just the uh, reconstruction term. Sorry, not just actually. Reconstruction term was one. Second one was the KL term. Right? If you remember. Yeah. Right? Third is now the gradients coming from this particular generation process. Right? So, uh, just like your generator and uh, discriminator. So, now this becomes a generator for the, this discriminator. This is the GAN that we're talking about. Right. Correct. So Q phi, so that will try to. Uh, correct. But the, the second term is what? It's between Q phi of Z given X to PZ. Here we are saying even, huh, even when you uh, do it across all data points, that also needs to be uh, close to PZ. This scale, and we're saying okay, we'll not use scale. We'll use some other metric, which is uh, as we know for now. Uh, I mean, as we know the in E and Goodfellows is one. It is some Jensen Shannon divergence something, right? But the, at the end, the point is they want to make this to be equal to each other. So this is how you would use this sort of thing. So okay, so th this is uh, you know uh, one approach. So th this sort of actually uh, also uh, gives to rise to an idea called as adversarial autoencoders. So uh, where you use this adversarial le learning uh, in this autoencoder framework itself. So this K this scale divergence is then not done using your usual scale divergence. Rather, you will do it through, uh, you know, this uh, GAN net GAN setup. Okay. This is the uh, uh, using info VA. Um, intuition about conditional GANs. Huh, yes. Okay, so here uh, again, coming back to the idea of conditional generation, as we discussed that time, was that let's say I have uh, a, a sam sample which are like this X and Y. I have some data and I have a label associated with them. What we want to do is we want P of X given Y. So given a given a uh, you know kind of label or whatever, I want to generate samples only belonging to that particular label. Right now in GANs uh, conditional uh, this one, what people have done is basically something like this. So uh, let's say you have a generator, right? Theta. So I have the Z being given here, right? Now again, this should be very clear that uh, 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 because the generator is at the end going to generate images. So ideally this should also have the information about yeah. the label, right? Very simple. So this gives me uh generated images right p theta of x given by this is exactly what it is doing right now uh for a y give me x now then now what you will do is you will pass this through the discriminator again you will want to pass uh, uh, you will you will want to uh give images which are of the same class ideally right and pass it through a discriminator 
right now uh, here uh, this is this is part i'm not sure why it's 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 done that way but um, this discriminator should also ideally have the information about why right uh, but i've seen people i don't know people don't do this or whatever i'm not sure why though so this d also has information about why so sorry they don't i i don't know why i mean that's yeah question i don't understand still ideally this should have right because because then okay what what can happen otherwise um see so okay so think of for example let's say you you, you want to generate from let, let's say for example from a uh, let's say your cat and dog same example we'll use right so if your generator is not honoring that particular uh, you know uh, class conditional distribution if it gives a cat image for a dog uh, input because your discriminator doesn't care about labels anymore it will still say okay it will still say okay you know i'm i'm confused about this and therefore it's a valid sample right but rather that's not something that, that we wanted though right so for a dog image your and your whatever cat image your discriminator should also have this information about the label yeah you are getting some data and get label right use the data to generate an image right and what are you getting px px of x given by no so samples so of the same thing okay. ha some data get image correct okay. ha then what's the problem then ha so your discriminator should also have information about the label Uh -huh. so why because if you share the discriminator across both these classes okay so uh, let's say let's say your generator that is g g for example function goes on and ignores y altogether okay and it says i will not learn distribution for dogs at all i will learn only cat distribution so let's say regardless of whatever y you give me uh -huh. Even that is the true thing, right? Correct. Ha, that's the true thing. Ha, it has dog in it. Correct. That is true. But the the generator can fool the discriminator just by giving out cat images. Cat images. Ha. Okay. Right. Ideally. Yes. Yes. Ha na ha. So for. In a, in a particular batch, let even if you do all of that, at the end the question is when when generating samples, the if the generator ends up ignoring y and says okay I will generate only cat images. If I pass those to, to the discriminator, this will tell me yes you are right, it's it's as good as a good sample, but it's not true. I mean what what I wanted right. So ideally if D has the information about label also, then it can tell okay. Uh, for a dog image this this particular image that i got cat was not at all right so surely it is it, it is a generated image not a true image not a true cat image sort of a thing so d should also i mean ideally hopefully should also have the right. label of one but then also mm. it will create some like uh, complications in the sense like mm. so one by label is cat and the variable is dog so right so how complicated the gradient in that case and vice versa Okay. Why? Why not? Why? Why? Why would that be a problem? Okay. So, for example, huh. see the actual distribution, actual image this time is for dog. Okay. But now, you generated an image using the label of the cat. Okay. So now, if there is no like label information, it will be uh, distributed only in a certain way, whether it's same or different. Ah, uh, uh, ah, huh. ha. Real or real, real, real or fake? Ah, yeah. Huh. Hmm. But like, for example, like uh, if the actual image is there of a dog and the label is there of a cat, hmm. so in that case, like, so are you trying to learn them four discriminators? No, no, no. Or like, let it. Uh, ha huh. so sing single discriminator, but it will have access to that all label, the all the information. So two more inputs. actual label and generated label yes correct no no generated label i don't have with me no see but you are giving this why generated label you don't want to give 
no no see again i am not generating label at all no i am generating only image ha huh, right so now that particular image belongs to that label or not i don't know it can be it can be anything that is my problem right so it can what can happen at the end of the day is i i give the dog as the in, uh, label but it generates a cat image for me which is very bad right i want to fix that so the only way to fix a generator is from gradient spy from discriminator right, right? now if if the discriminator also does, uh, doesn't know the label it will say oh this this is actually looks like a real cat image okay so go ahead nothing to you are fine nothing to update for you right it's not to that distribution actual distribution for yeah. it right but it's so, not yeah, no. uh, so in that case it's, huh. it's possible that it won't look at the whole distribution but rather on the label subset of either only cats or only cats ha huh, dogs like that just to make sure it goes the discriminator it's not able to like if it's a bipolar distribution it's not able to capture any of them and but rather the like oh even a worse condition okay. yeah that sort of a thing similar to mode collapse yes so there we have uh, modes in the, in the in, in the distribution itself here again because of labeling again you have another modes so it, it may capture just one sort of mode for one uh, for all labels and you'll just end up not learning anything that's so idea, the idea is basically in the actual label is there on cat mm. it should say that whether the generated image is a real cat image real cat not. image or not ha huh? not can be anything but i want only cat image correct I think that's what yeah. it should supposed to be, yeah. and uh, then uh, so that's 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 the thought process, and and then people also have done something like uh, uh, so whatever has, has been generated, they pass it through a classifier again to uh, generate y uh, again, and that is then used to update both the discriminator. So here, basically, this particular image is then yeah. passed through a classifier uh, to generate y y hat. and we know what the true y is so this is then used to compute the loss here so y minus y hat or whatever is used to compute the loss so it, this is trained from that additionally this will also get trained because obviously output is coming from here ha uh, predicting the y the label ha huh. so so that sort of uh, uh, circumvents the issue of this common discriminator right so if you don't have a class also it, it has to do well do that's it. that's the thing so therefore the generated image has to follow some like distribution of distribution the label. of the label compulsorily by adding this classifier right is the classifier also feeding to the gradients to regenerate no uh, it should no it it, yeah. it 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 will okay ha huh. ideally it should because otherwise then then basically so if, if there's a mistake in the in the generated image right. how will it fix right. that's the idea so it it will try to fix it because this y hat internally has this x hat for example let's say this is x generator whatever right x hat x hat is again has g theta of let's say z comma y right this is this how the gradients will flow so y hat to x hat is classifier parameters x hat to z and y is uh, generator parameters and therefore it will it will learn that okay. right okay so this is about conditional gans um so this is all about gans actually Uh, nothing much to uh, add here so any uh, any thoughts uh, or sh should should we, if you want we can do like a tutorial if required part of tutorial again or we'll move on to revision models next class so what is the like uh, application of these gans other than generating images generating video no the, the point was to generate image <laughs> yeah Sorry. Yeah, that's what I've 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 seen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what is so much probably better? <laughs> <laughs> so one other. I need to just learn the distribution of data. Learn the distribution of the data. Yes. What about different machine learning? Like they are not able to do better. Ah, huh. right. So for example, let's say if. Uh, i mean for, for example let's say if you want to uh, do some sort of classification or you know whatever so because neural networks can uh, learn any random very bad boundaries or whatever they, they want to solve the to solve the problem at hand these sort of things they try to make sure that, okay you have learned the data well only then you're able to reason uh, about the uh, upcoming uh, classification problem 
So uh, same like in VAs, the idea was you could go to a latent space because the latent space has all information about X. You can use that to generate. You can use that to uh, solve a uh, downstream problem. Similarly here, but the issue here is we don't have access to the latent. So things like bygans and all of that can come into picture. So where you can uh, you know get that latent back, that can then be used in a, a downstream task. Oh, by the way, in cycle gains, they actually found an interesting issue. So I'll, 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 I forgot to mention this here. But so here. So for this horse zebra example, they got very good images and all of that. That was very nice. What I, what ended up happening is for one particular image where I have a let's say a horse, right? Um, and I have a person sitting on that person, right? So for this, it colored the person and the horse in the black and white stripes. So it made the person also zebra in some sense. So they say that okay, these sort of issues are still there. It's not learned completely perfectly. Either it's possible that uh, we don't have enough images of persons riding the horse to for it to be able to learn it back, right? Moreover, persons sitting on zebra is another level of issue. That image you will never have. Uh, it's very rare you will get that image, right? So uh, these sort of maps, it's still not able to do. It's not that it does everything well. So yeah, but these things are there. These some small small issues will be there. This is one interesting thing that they mentioned in the paper. There's one other GAN called Wasserstein GAN. Uh, let's see if we can do that in the next class. Uh, that basically addresses this uh, problem of. Uh, uh, OK, so I'll just give you an intuition on, on, on what that is. Um, so. So here what they say is uh, this generator uh, that I have, let's say Z is a uh, you know uh, your you initial uh, random variable. Let's say it's lying in some 120 dimensional space. Right. Uh, and you apply a generator and you get an image. For example, let's say this image. This is for example lying in some let's say 32 cross 32 cross 3. Right. For example, let's say uh, 1024 pixels and three grayscale images or whatever, right? So I get three zero seven two dimensional space, right? Uh, now, so what they have shown is that if you use any of these divergence metrics, any this D F whole family that you have, um, uh, because uh, of the fact that so what the the claim is this three zero seven two dimensional uh, data. Will actually lie in a 120 dimensional uh, lower ma lower manifold. This again go back, goes back to the uh, yeah. manifold hypothesis sort of issue, right? So their point is that if you want to look at uh, distances which are in which are existing in different dimensionals themselves, right? Because this lies in 120 dimensional manifold, your data is still in a higher dimensional. Right, it may not be 128. It may be like let's say 276 or anything other other uh, other valued uh, manifold. It may, it may lie, right? So this this generated, and your actual x. These two may may lie in different dimensions now. So uh, all these divergence metrics basically they cannot handle this uh, issue of dimension mismatch, uh, and they show using some mathematical proofs and all. And then they propose a way to solve this problem using uh, another uh, metric called as Wasserstein metric. Uh, go ahead. X is definitely like the non and uh -huh. Yeah. Huh, right. But why are you trying? What are you trying with this matching metric? Huh, see, at the end, what is happening? DF is now looking at differences between this distribution and this distribution, right? Their claim is this distribution lies in a 128 dimensional manifold. This distribution lies in, let's say, for example, some other 300 dimensional manifold. Ah, though there's non nonlinearity, they 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 show that yeah, it it doesn't actually lie in this space or even in this space, and they say that okay, even if you're able to come to this space, there'll still be mismatch. I mean. If it is not even 128, if it is let's say 200 also, dimensional space, 
there is still a dimensional mismatch between these two uh, distributions that causes all of these metri all of these uh, f2 metrics to fail and you will not be able to learn good enough gradients for your g function to be able to do well so for that they uh, they uh, mention something called as metric which is able to handle this dimension mismatch sort of input issue space. in the input space also exactly so and then uh, and the the neat part of this is it when you apply a metric it turns out to be a gan so they didn't uh, approach the problem by saying okay we will solve this problem in gans rather when they said okay this is the issue with the metric if you if you choose a different metric it turns out to be again a sort of a gan formulation where you have to have two networks which will solve uh, differently uh, 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 and an adversarial sort of a metric will come out so that we can do it next class and then we'll look at the division uh, division models so i will close the class today here um let me stop the recording oh shanti